All right, we're going to talk about socialism and communism. Uh, this place is, this playlist is about more to Marx. Uh, the next playlist will be about after Marx, socialism and communism after Marx. Quote, whenever men have private property and money is the measure of everything, there it is hardly possible for the commonwealth to be governed justly or to flourish in prosperity. Uh, that is a quote from Thomas More's Utopia. Modern socialism, like classical conservatism, began in part as a critique of the liberalism of the late 18th and early 19th centuries. Like the conservatives, socialists objected to the liberal emphasis on self-interest, competition, and individual liberty. For socialists like myself, we believe then, as now, that human beings are by nature social or communal creatures or animals. Individuals do not live or work in isolation of each other, but in fact in cooperation with one another. It is cooperation among individuals, not competition between them, that socialists see as the foundation of a society in which everyone can enjoy a decent measure of liberty, justice, and prosperity. But socialists, unlike classical conservatives, assign no particular value to tradition or custom, nor do they share the conservatives' fondness for private property. From the socialist viewpoint, in fact, private property is the source of the class divisions that place some people in positions of power and privilege while condemning others to poverty and powerlessness. Indeed, socialists usually call for programs that will distribute wealth and power more evenly throughout society, programs that distribute the wealth, programs that conservatives typically deplore as leveling. Everything that people produce, socialists say, is in some sense a social product, and everyone who participates in producing a good is entitled to share in it. This means that society as a whole, and not private individuals, should own and control property for the benefit of all. That is the fundamental conviction that all socialists share. But what exactly does this mean? How much property and what kinds is society to own and control? Um... To this question, different socialists have responded in very different ways. Some suggest that most goods should be regarded as public property. Others maintain that only the major means of production, such as rivers and forests, large factories and mines, should be publicly owned and controlled. Most socialists fall somewhere between these two positions with no clear point of agreement, except on the general principle that anything that contributes significantly to the production, distribution, and delivery of socially necessary goods must be socially controlled for the benefit of all. This raises a second question. How is society to exercise this control? It is one thing to say that society as a whole should own and control a power plant, but quite another to say just how society is to operate this plant. Is everyone to take a turn working in the plant or to have a say in its daily operations? No socialist goes that far. Instead, socialists have generally argued for either centralized or decentralized control of public property. Those who favor centralized control want to see the state or government assume the responsibility for managing property and resources in the name of the whole society. This indeed was the approach followed in the Soviet Union. Uh, this approach promotes efficiency, centralists say, because it gives the state power to, pay, to plan coordinate, and manage the whole economy in the interest of every member of society. Other socialists, for example, like myself, dispute this claim by pointing to the top-heavy and sluggish bureaucracies that dominate centrally planned economies. As we see it, the best way to exercise control over public property is to, de is to decentralize, to vest this control in groups at the local level, especially groups of the workers who labor in the factories' fields, and the shops and of the consumers who purchase and use the workers' products. These people are the ones who feel most directly the effects of the use of social property, so they should decide how the property is to be used. Like conservatives and liberals, in short, socialists differ among themselves on important issues, but socialists are united in their opposition to unrestricted capitalism, which they believe determines the distribution of power in every society in which it is the dominant form of economic exchange. Poor people have a good deal less power than the rich, less power because they have less ability to control and direct their own lives and to choose where and how to live. In a, cap in a capitalist society, socialists charge terms like freedom and slogans such as equality of opportunity 
rang hollow for many working people. To see why socialists object to capitalism, we need to examine their conceptions of human nature and freedom. With that as background, we shall then explore the history of socialism. On nature and freedom. It is often said, especially in the United States of America, that socialism is contrary to human nature and opposed to freedom. Socialists dispute both of these claims. They deny first that people are by nature competitive and self-interested. If people appear to be selfish and competitive, they argue it is because social circumstances have encouraged these traits. Again, past, uh, past uh, circumstances and present circumstances determine who we are, not because human nature makes us that way. With regard to freedom, socialists are certainly opposed to the liberal individualist understanding of freedom that we discussed earlier, and to the conservatives' notion of order, ordered liberty described earlier as well. But this is because socialists propose an alternative conception of freedom, not because they consider freedom undesirable or unpertinent. The, un the socialist view of human nature and freedom can be readily understood by referring once again to our triad tri uh, triadic model for socialists, the agent who is to be free is not the abstract or isolated individual, but individuals in relations. Human beings are by nature and inclination social or communal creatures. Again, the agent would be individuals in relations. In particular, we should think of agents as individuals engaged in relations of production, distribution, and exchange with others. The agent, in other words, is the producer or worker, viewed not as an isolated individual, but as a member of a class, the working class. Members of the working class share several common goals. Furthermore, including but not restricted to the following. Fulfilling work, a fair share of the product that they produce or the profits thereof, a voice in the management of their affairs, and an equal opportunity for everyone in order to develop and use his or her talents to their fullest extent. In pursuing these goals, finally, workers find that the system of capitalist production thwarts their aspirations by throwing various obstacles in their way. These obstacles or barriers can be either material or mental. They include the division of society into a wealthy class of owners and a poorer class of producers who are forced to sell their labor to eke out a subsistence living. People who must devote most of their time and energy merely to making a living can scarcely hope to develop fully their talents and aspirations. The division of society into classes of unequal political power and economic wealth also results in the sharpening and hardening of class differences that perpetuate these inequalities from one generation to the next. The rich get richer, the old saying goes, and the poorer get, poorer get poorer. And of course, many people have different sentiments, and so those focusing on work cannot be able to develop their sentiments and individual passions as well as their potential. And to the extent that the rich own or at any rate control the system of education and information, radio and TV stations, newspapers, and so on, they are able to raise and maintain still other obstacles. They can, for example, erect and maintain mental barriers by seeing to it that the poor remain ignorant of radical alternatives to the status quo. In this way, the members of the poorer classes may be kept in ignorance of their true or real interests. They don't even know that they don't know, producing a double ignorance and they are ignorant in their, of their true or real interest and of the alternative political visions and economic arrangements that might better serve those interests. To be truly free, then, is to be free from such obstacles and to be free to pursue one's aims and aspirations, so long, that is, as they are not detrimental or harmful to others in a utilitarianist sense. Thus, one should not be free to make a private profit off the labor of another because we are social and communal animals. It, it makes no sense to speak of one person's being free and another's not Either we all are free or none is. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels made this point in the Manifesto of the Communist Party when they proclaimed that in a socialist society, quote, the condition for the free development of each is the free development of all, end quote. This conceptualization of freedom, quite different from the liberal view examined earlier, is summarized in the socialist view of freedom, where the agent is the common or people or the working people, the obstacle would be the class divisions, economic inequalities, unequal life chances, and false consciousness. And the goal of the agent would be fulfillment of human needs, such as satisfying work and fair share of products. Next, we will go over the uh, precursors of socialism.